Hello and welcome to Gemini Network Open Live. I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor at Gemini Network Open. Of course, if you're following along live, please send us your questions or comments at, on Twitter at Gemini Network Open or in Facebook or YouTube in the comment box by the video. Today, we're talking about ambulatory follow-up and outcomes among Medicare beneficiaries after emergency department discharge. And we've got first and senior authors, Michelle Lynn and Laura Burke with us. Welcome, Dr. Lynn, Dr. Burke. How are you? Wonderful. How are you? Doing well, great thank you. Uh, yeah, really great to see you two both as well. Uh, so uh, let's just start off, uh, if both of you could uh, just introduce yourselves to the audience, tell us a little bit about who you are and what inspired you to do this study here. Sure. Um, so I am an assistant professor of emergency medicine and population health here at Mount Sinai in New York City. Um, my research interest is in uh, examining how we measure outcomes after ED discharge. And I, um, you know, I think as we all know, we discharge a majority of patients. We've been discharging more and more elderly patients uh, who are more complex. Um, and one of the uh, things that we always tell our patients is to follow up with their primary care doctor. Um, but we don't really know how often that even happens and whether or not that has an impact on outcomes. Um, so I partnered with Laura uh, to do the study um, where, uh, you know, we examined a large cohort of Medi Medicare beneficiaries to describe how often they follow up and what happens to them. I'm Laura Burke. I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And like Michelle, I'm a health services researcher, and I've long had an interest in understanding how emergency care fits into the broader healthcare system and the role that ED plays in delivering value and also improving outcomes and uh, coordination of emergency care within the broader healthcare landscape. Great. Well, this is a really interesting paper. Uh, I think the first thing we can talk about is in figure one, it just shows what the time from uh, ED, ED discharge to follow-up is. You can see there's kind of like a big spike early on in kind of the first week. It's up to, what is it, 40% of people had follow-up, and then by a month, it was about uh, 70%. Um, so can you talk to that at all? You know, sure. Yeah. You, expect. you said we tell everybody to follow up, but who does? Yeah, you know, and I think it's uh, it's important to note that, that these are Medicare beneficiaries, so they all have insurance, and for the most part, um, you know, they uh, should be able to get an appointment. Um, so I think the fact that only 40% of them had a follow-up appointment within seven days and 70% within 30 days, you know, this is a high-risk, 65 and older population, uh, suggests that there are additional factors at play. Um, you know, and we saw lower rates among black beneficiaries, among dual eligible beneficiaries in those treated rural hospitals. Um, so, so we know that some of those things contribute to differences in access. Right, and then the next part, punchline here, which just shows how many patients uh, came back to an ED, got admitted to an inpatient stay, or went on to die uh, during the third day period. Um, and those rates were, were pretty interesting. It was, I think, 17% returned, 9.4 admitted, and 1.4% died. Yeah, so that's interesting though. So the hazard ratio for um, for an ED what was it, for mortality was 0.5. So if you had follow-up, you were about half as likely to die. Uh, both, regardless, either way, the, uh, there's basically the same likelihood of return ED visit, but then a, about a 20% higher chance of uh, being admitted if you had a follow-up visit. So that seems a little surprising because those are you know, directionally different, it seems. Yeah, so we actually um, loved working on this analysis. I got to work closely with uh, biostatistician John Ora uh, doing a study on survival analysis. And the way that we addressed this um, was by using follow-up as a time-varying covariate. So we looked at each outcome separately, ED visits, mortality, and hospitalizations. And so, you know, one of the criticisms people had was, well, of course, patients who um, follow up are less likely to die. They're healthy enough so that they can follow up. And because they don't die, they're actually alive and able to follow up. But we addressed this by using follow-up as a time-varying covariate. So we made sure that we only compared ED patients with follow-up to those without at the exact same time point. So if at day patients at day seven who had follow-up versus patients that didn't, and we showed that having follow-up was associated with lower risk of mortality. 
Um, and you know, some might say, well, perhaps there still might be ways that those patients are healthier and that explains your finding. But I think the fact that the hospitalization outcome was directionally different would go against this. Healthier patients are less likely to die, but they're not less likely to be hospitalized. And this fits with a body of literature that suggests that um, you know, not all revisits to the ED or the hospital are necessarily a bad thing. In fact, uh, there had been a prior study by Maria Raven that had suggested that sometimes, quote unquote, bounce backs, these return visits are seen as an adverse outcome. But in fact, they could be that patients are appropriately following precautions to return and that that is actually life saving. Um, and the fact that we found that you know, follow up led to more repeat visits suggests that maybe primary care physicians and other outpatient providers are doing their job and recognizing patients who are critically ill and sending them back to the hospital when they really need it. Yep, that's a really good point. I think that was one of the first one of the first things when I tried to work my head around that is I think we, you know, 10, 15 years ago, especially with the the discussion around the ACA before its passage, there was a lot of discussion. Well, if we get people primary care docs. They'll go to the ER less. They'll need to be hospitalized less. Um, but one of the things I think we've seen across a range of different studies is when people, when we try to get people better care or better outpatient care, they get more care, and yeah. getting more care identifies more problems, and people end up in the hospital more. Right. I think it's interesting because that was one of the arguments for the ACA. But then, if you compared ED utilization in the United States to say regions of Canada or other countries with universal insurance rates are ED utilization rates are actually pretty similar. Um, and again, giving people less care isn't necessarily better. And that includes ED visits as well. We're all emergency care providers. And we happen to think that oftentimes the care that we provide patients is beneficial. And we know that oftentimes people come to us or are sent to us precisely because we can do things to improve their health outcomes, including admitting them when that's necessary. I would just add, yeah, I, it, all those things that you that guys said, and also that, you know, the fact that we are discharging these people, we're trying to get them home, and they're still high risk, um, you know, and so I think this really amplifies the importance of what we do with respect to care coordination and care transitions, um, and, uh, you know, that we can have an impact on, you know, real outcomes like mortality. Great. We've got um, uh, a couple people have joined us, Tony Jones and Sam Stepflug. Sorry, Sam, I have no idea how to pronounce your last name, but Sam's a friend. <laughs> and uh, we actually have a question from a, from a viewer. Stephanie Jansen asks, were you able to understand the underlying reasons for follow-up or lack thereof? Um, we actually didn't delve too much into the actual diagnoses for follow-up. We were fairly inclusive, so you know we we didn't just limit it to primary care, but that was a big proportion. But basically, any ambulatory follow up visit um, that wasn't in a hospital based setting, we counted. So we really gave people to the option to follow up across a broad range of settings. But you know that is a good idea for future studies to see why they potentially would follow up, and we can't guarantee that a follow-up visit was necessarily related to that initial hospitalization. Um, we just sought to be inclusive in that regard. But even being very inclusive, still only 40% had a follow-up within a week, in which we would expect, especially for this high-risk cohort, most people you would want to have a follow-up within a week, certainly more than 40%. Yep. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, so I think that's the main points I had here. Uh, I didn't get to it when you were discussing your um, time varying, uh, your use of the time varying variable, but I just love I mean, immortal time bias is one of my favorite biases to address. And just the fact that you got to address it and got to work in the paper, and mortality bias into a paper is always fun because it's just, you know, we know there are biases. We know if we had analyzed stuff certain ways, there's going to be certain findings. Uh, so, so I don't know. That's always fun. So it's also just fun to talk about mortality in scientific papers. <laughs> So uh, any final thoughts on the paper or ED visits in general you want to get in before we finish up? I, I actually think it'll be interesting to see in when, with the expansion of telemedicine, you know, how it'll look. We know that rural hospitals um, um, are serving a greater role in the ED. Margaret Greenwick Erickson's paper in Gem Network Open, I think last year or the year before, had shown the greater role of the EDs in delivering emergency care, yet they have greater barriers to outpatient access. And maybe with the increased use of telemedicine in the COVID era, we could start to fill in some of the gaps. So the degree to which telemedicine can solve this issue, I think would be really interesting to study in the future. Yeah, and I'll be interested to see how, you know, I think, um, you know, I guess, 
value-based care and payers integrate this evidence because I think that for the most part, emergency providers have been ignored and, you know, seen as someone to ultimately, you know, be cut out of population health. And I think this underscores the fact that patients are coming. Uh, they're coming because they're sick um, and that getting us involved in making sure that uh, they have the right transition of care and uh, get to the right provider afterwards uh, is really critical to improving outcomes. Right. Well, really great points. Thank you both so much for uh, about the paper itself and for coming on the show today. Um, of course, if you're watching, you can get this paper for free online at GemmaNetworkOpen.com. We've got new papers coming out every weekday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And join us again next week at 3 p.m. on Tuesday Central Time for another episode of JNO Live. So take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.